Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 81st episode of the Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend, another co-host, Michael Hamilton. Uh, I had a really good thing I was going to ask you. I was thinking about it on the train. I was like, ooh, this is what I want to talk about with Michael on the podcast. I'm going to ask him this question. It's going to be a really good question, and everybody's going to love it. It's going to be a profound question that would change the course of humanity. Oh, that's a lot of pressure on one little question. I forgot it. <laughs> I'm old. Hmm. No. What What was I thinking about on the train? Remember the train? Remember all the I, trains we took over the weekend? I do remember. We, we rode the train three separate times. One of them was just like a train. We got off one train, got on another train immediately, but we rode the train. It was a good time. We played a lot of Flesh and Blood. We got a cafe, cart, cabin, space, whatever it's called. The cafe room where we got to lay out some play mats on their tables, play some Flesh and Blood, play a bunch of heavy hitters sealed. Uh, yeah, it was a good time. Good train ride. I did have fun. It was a good time. We played so much heavy hitter seal, we almost missed our flight back home. That's that's true. We were at the airport because we got to the airport like four and some hours before our flight. So we just like sat around playing heavy hitters and then looked at my, or you said it was 4.30 at one point. I'm like, it's 4.30. We're supposed to be at the gate like five <laughs> minutes ago. So we that was spooky. We quickly packed up and made it and we... We're like the last ones to board the plane. And then we sat there for 15 minutes before we started moving and they shut the doors. Yeah. We, we sat down and they were like, boarding will conclude in 20 minutes. And I was like, oh, okay. It was it was not as spooky as it felt at the time, but. Mm-hmm. What about you, Michael? Did you have, did you think of any profound questions to ask me over the weekend? I feel like I just ask you any questions I have. Maybe that's like a pie and I should save them for the podcast, but usually we're just hanging out. I'm like, hey, Roger, what's, what do you think about X? You've never asked me what I think about X before. X? What do you think about X? Uh, I wish it was still called Twitter. <laughs> you, you made your own personal account on there a while back. So that's cool. Yeah. And then, uh, so uh, all my opinions are my own or is in my bio and stuff like that. And I guess it's just it's just hard to be a content creator and be entertaining and try to give feedback or when something's bothering you to not dial it up or under dial it, you know, it's hard to just give, just hit that sweet spot of entertaining and not abrasive, but also not like, Oh, everything's perfect all the time. And I love everything. Like, yeah, like I, I still want to be Yourself. genuine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I also don't want my genuine self to be an asshole. So, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of things to balance. <laughs> but just – and there is a good better point where, you know, just overall being pleasant on social media or as a community gets harder and harder as we grow. Like there was uh, people on Twitter uh, – talking about how there's been uh, harassment uh, just towards like even women and things like that in the community lately. And that's not cool. Uh, That's obviously not something I would ever do or am okay with. And um, it's really unfortunate that it happened in in situations like this come up. But at the end of the day, all I can do is just try to be as supportive and nice as I can be to the people I interact with. So um, hopefully that person feels still feels welcome in the flesh and blood community and will continue to be a part of it. Yeah. Well said. You want to talk, anyway, <laughs> you want to talk about the calling we had last weekend? I don't really want to talk about that. That's the reason why I'm talking about all this. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I want to talk about the calling. I know you want to talk about it, Michael. I bet you have lots of things to talk about. I don't okay. have, I play two rounds of the calling buddy. I don't have a lot to say about it. Don't register Victor. That's my that's my, my calling story. So is it okay if I talk about it? Go for it. Sure. Right. Floor is yours, Michael Hamilton. All right. So we played a lot of seals, both like online and on the train leading up to Hartford. And I think this is a really good format. That's kind of my takeaway. 
there's like a lot of a lot of decisions to make both in your deck building how many cards you present where i don't think this is the first format where i've consistently presented more than 30 cards not with every deck but like i would say more than half my decks i present more than 30 cards or at least more than half my matchups which is very unusual for me <laughs> i guess i think there's a lot to learn about this format it's a very good format um so at the calling you said you played victor you don't want to talk about that at all <laughs> I agonized and agonized during the whole building process. And at the end of it, I there was one of those half tokens. And I said, if it comes up Vigor, I play Warrior. And if it comes up Might, I play Guardian. I think those are the two sides of that one. Yeah. I don't know. But I landed on the one that, that was Victor. And uh, I cl- clicked the, I, I checked the Victor box and handed in my sheet with like one minute left. In the, in before deck building was done i just agonized over it yeah and i think that one thing that i kind of realized from both like i actually really processed this saturday night or friday night when i was playing a pool against eric in the hotel lobby or not the hotel lobby in our hotel room where he played victor and i played a ko deck and i had like 37 playables and I just kind of, I just played the 37 cards and it seemed really hard for Victor to be able to kill me because Victor has no, no evasion and you have, it's hard for guardians to consistently get a lot of value per card when, if they're having to use a lot of their cards to block and then brutes have similar numbers where they can attack for six and seven with a lot of their cards and spend one card to attack for six and seven. So I guess ultimately it's kind of hard for victor to not get fatigued he doesn't have evasion he doesn't have huge damage turns like warriors can push high damage numbers and they have some evasion with their attack reactions betsy has a lot of evasion with her overpower and then brutes are capable of putting out 15 plus damage turns sometimes and they also have access to intimidate victor doesn't have any overpower any any intimidate anything to any attack reactions it's just you basically if your opponent is going to block with four cards every turn you just have to run them out of cards to win so i think you Victor, you kind of have to play a lot or play more than 30 cards in some matchups. And if you don't have a pool that really supports you playing like 35 plus cards, I don't think it's the best idea to register Victor in sealed. Yeah. And even if we just think about mechanically at the set, like fundamentally, where KO hero ability just makes all the brute cards and rewards you for just doing really baseline like brute effects with the windups and things like that and then reiner just does it a little like differently arguably worse uh the the, his intimidate is hard to get a lot of value out of it consistently but ko's uh value is very clear and consistent look at the two warriors where kasai it's very evident that she's able to get a lot of value out of her hero ability there's lots of warrior cards that draw cards between even rare attack reactions like cut the deck or draw swords so she's able to consistently get value out of that aspect of her hero ability just by drawing cards you know with gold tokens or whatever and you know you're just going to play red and yellow cards so then you just have a really easy way to get value out of your weapon attacks and 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 demonstrate that you know your hero is doing something powerful with just basically any card pool that warrior supports Mm -hmm. then you have olympia (laughs) <laughs> and he sometimes gives you some little teeny tiny extra value uh, if you wager correctly, or you have a w- Olympia hat, and apparently that's broken enough to carry you to a top eight. And <laughs> then, we'll you look at the, <laughs> then you look at the Guardians, and there's Betsy, and it's like, okay, well, she very specifically needs wager, so that's already more niche than than Kao or Kasai. Like she's she's doing a thing that's that's wagering, and you have to put resources in in order to get this overpower keyword in plus one. And sometimes the overpower matters a lot. And then sometimes your opponent has like a block card or an attack reaction and a three block and a piece of equipment. And it's just, it's not doing very much anyways. So that's already a little weird. And then you have Victor who is supposed who has just this generic flatline ability of whenever you generate a gold token or an effect you control. So if if you win with your opponent's test of strengths, whenever you still don't, get your gold drop i learned that the hard way uh (laughs) but he gets to draw a card for the gold generation and then 
Clash does not appear on anything below rare in the set. So that except whole... Test of Strength. Oh, except Test of Strength. You're right. You're, you're right. Test of Strength is, is the one exception at common. But it's very hard to get value out of that. And there's a hero in the set that just hard wins <laughs> clashes. Like, how do you ever be like you reveal a six, KO reveals a six, but her the, the KO six is actually a seven, you lose. And that's just so consistent and common that it's so hard for Victor to ever win a clash against KO, especially when 80% of the field or whatever <laughs> in the sealed is registering KO. So it's just really, really hard to get value out of Victor. And the, like, there's just no good ways to get gold easily, obviously, for good reasons. Like starting stake sucks if you're just casting it. It's just broken because it's a block three non-attack action. It's, uh, it's not broken. It's playable because it's a non-attack yellow block three. Sure. People are never letting performance bonus hit, especially if you're Victor. They just, and it, it's not like it's hard to prevent it from hitting. It's just a three powered attack. They're just like, okay, here's my three powered attack. You did it. Sometimes okay. I, I learned a combo over the weekend. If you have one might token and you attack with a performance bonus from Arsenal, then it's coming in for four. Go again. That's two cards. Might token plus performance bonus. Write that one down. <laughs> That's my Yeah. <laughs> So the Guardians are just starting behind the eight ball in their hero abilities, I feel like, when compared to the other heroes. And then you look at, like, Thunk and Wallop. And you're <laughs> like, so KO always wins the Clash. And there are these cards that say when you win the Clash, get a small marginal bonus. It's yeah. like, okay, sure. Yeah. I, I was dumb. I think on top of that, I think it's not really debatable that Warriors just have the, or sorry, Guardians just have the weakest weapon in the set. High High Riser is definitely weaker than Mandible Claws, weaker than Centauri Sabers. Both of those weapons are constructed level weapons. They're, they see constructed play and probably will until they're living legended out. Whereas High High Riser is almost certainly not going to see constructed play. It's not very impactful just three resources for three damage and the draw card condition is a lot harder to meet than titan's just titan fists titan's fists condition of having a three cost in your pitch zone yeah and what drew me to playing victor also was i had a miller's grindstone so i was like i don't even have to play high riser i got miller's grindstone baby let's grind him out I didn't win a single goddamn clash with that card. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many minus one counters on it, Michael. I was swinging for two, and my opponents were just looking at me like, whatever, I take two on KO. I reveal a five, or which is actually a six at the end of the game. And I'm like, well, I reveal my blue wage agility. Oh, you still win. Okay, cool. Uh, here, now I'm attacking for one. I you can't put wage agility in your victor deck. But... Or wa wage vigor. Whatever blue wage I had in. I wish I had wage agility in my deck. That means I wouldn't been stupid victor yeah oh which jelly is really good why didn't i play with more pools and see how bad miller's grindstone is beforehand i thought it was good and it was not good it was so bad yeah so bad i i do think if i'm playing if i have a shield and high riser like the the one block shield if you're lower than them i'd always play miller's grindstone over the shield I don't want it anymore. I think, I think it's easier to get one value out of the stupid shield than your... Well, the first time you attack for four with the Miller's Grindstone, you got one value out of it because High Riser would attack for three. And if you win the Clash or they block it out, then you get one value you get next time you attack with it. You never win the Clash, Michael. You can't. <laughs> Warriors exist. Sure. Or you tie the Clash too. But that's one... Uh, I do think that Thunk and Wallop Honestly, they are not statted very well. They were very careful with statting some of these Guardian attacks. I think Concuss and Command Respect, they have really impactful on hits. It makes sense that they're weaker than Raging Onslaught. They have six power instead. But Thunk and Wallop, they have, or I think Wallop is the four cost one that has the same attack values as Raging Onslaught at the color cycle, but it costs one more resource and it gets this very, very, very marginal upside that if you win a clash with it, you get an extra token. And then Thunk costs two more than Raging Onslaught for only one more attack. So I, I would say both these cards are a full point below rates and four and five costs are 
really awkward to make work. So it's like, they're both like a, a cost point that is awkward to make work. And then they also are one point below rate. So I think they're just very, very underwhelming for being three blocks. Yeah. And could you imagine if your class just had like a three for seven with upside, like that would be and block three, that would be crazy. Like if you just had like if a class had access to like a three cost attack, maybe it let you like get like a specific token. If you beat from your chess. Class. <laughs> if you if you do something and you know, maybe it would play and synergize well with your hero ability or something like that. Like could you imagine if that was the case and then you put wallop and thunk in the set, it's just like Yeah. I- Guardians are definitely weaker than Brutes in terms of card for card and in terms of their hero ability. Well, hero power, I think they are worse than KO and their weapons worse. So like, I think in general, the Guardians are definitely just the weakest in limited in this format. But that said, I do- So tell me about the good. What's what's the good in the Guardian then? Tell me what I should have been looking for. The good in the Guardians is, well, first Betsy can do some really, really- sick turns if she attacks she can attack for 13 14 15 overpower and do that twice your opponent's probably just dead a lot of the time they're just dead maybe not maybe they have a few health left if you do that twice and they have like some armor or like they draw a block card one of them but that's really strong um guardians can also force your well guardians aren't very good at spending four card hands but they're also with big bop and bigger than big you can kind of give, give your opponent a four or five card hand by just casting that and hope they can't spend it very efficiently because guardians aren't very guardians are never going to be super efficient in this format even like victor if you win a test of strength and draw an extra card for a gold you're still going to have trouble getting full value out of your hand just because the guardians so many of their cards are inefficient in this format but they do provide ways to force your opponent to play inefficiently uh concussed and command authority command respect I don't remember which one. Authority is the new warrior card. No, that's commanding presence. Oh. I guess command just equals arsenal destruction, I'm realizing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, command respect. Those two cards, if you pump them, they force your opponent to block them out. And a lot of the cards in this format block two. Even in Guardian, you have a lot of block twos. So, those two cards are forcing your opponent to block, basically, and they also block three, which is really nice. I think those are the two commons that you should be looking for. And then you want to support them with the wager auras a lot of the time. Yeah. And I'm just looking just at fundamentally. So guardian, I think the reason to play guardians is if you have several of the rare tower effects, I think Mm -hmm. you need a good, like I would say two to three of these somehow in your pool. Uh, I I think I had one, maybe two uh, because Colossal bearing, threatening to destroy a piece of armor, very powerful. And even smack a reality where when it's hits destroy all aura tokens they control. So that seems pretty good in the format where people are making a bunch of agilities and uh Vickers Vickers and bites. And, Yeah. So I think those two cards are very good. And then you obviously have to compare them with the auras like Big Bop or Bigger Than Big. Ideally in red, because that just just gets you to that tower keyword right off the bat. And so I don't know what the rest of your deck is supposed to look like at that point. I guess you really just want like concuss, command respects, the auras, and the, these attacks. Because even when we look at something like over the top, if it has uh, power greater than its base, it gets overpowered. That card's really under like underwhelming. I think I've seen that card go last pick. Many, 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 many times in my draft pods. Uh, and then and then speaking yeah. of a card that I know a thousand percent I've seen go last pick in many, many, many draft pods, stacked in your favor. Where so the aura. The, yeah, it's the aura that you're defending action action cards, attack action cards, not even just any action cards, just only attack action cards, which there's a whole class in the set that's also like if you att- block with an attack action card, even if you're blocking for a million, I still get value. Why would you do that, idiot? Uh, <laughs> and and then at the start of your turn, destroy this, draw a card, and put a card from your hand on top of your deck. And sure, that turns on your high roller or whatever, your hammer, high riser, but it blocks two. Its effect is so, like 
worse than what was the Welcome to Wraith common? There was a Welcome to Wraith common that was uh, almost exactly like this, right? Stamp Authority, you know not ta- Stamp Authority. I know what you're talking about. It's uh, yeah, there was one. one yeah, Welcome yeah. I I don't I never saw anybody play that card either in Welcome to Wraith, <laughs> and then they made it rare. So I I don't know. I, that's yeah. I yeah. I think over the top is kind of in the same boat as concuss and command respect where if it was a three for seven it'd be pretty good it'd be raging onslaught with upside which would be in line with some of the brute commons because you have to do a thing to get the effect but because it's one point below rates and um evasion isn't usually worth giving up points of value like like you compare it to uh pack hunt, which costs two for six power and it intimidates them. You're getting some evasion on your card that is at rate, whereas command or not, or sorry, over the top is not above rate. But jumping out back around, I actually think the biggest reason to play Guardian is the rare equipment. There is a lot of really good rare equipment that you can get. Both Victor and Betsy's hats are two blocks that well, Betsy's hats two block. Uh, temper so kind of a three block that gets a repeatable ability victor's hats a two block blade break that if you ever block it with it into yellow cards you get the gold you get to draw a card for victor's ability it's really strong um, both shields are really good the shield that clashes it blocks for it has one base block but when you block you with it you clash and if you win the clash it gets plus one defense so it blocks for two if you win the first clash it blocks for one additional if you win the second clash with it and you can be like, well, how are you going to win the clash? This shield just sits in play. You can wait and know. And if you pay, if you track your pitch in second cycle, you can like kind of make sure you have a reasonable card to clash with. I found it pretty hard to track both my pitch and my opponent's pitch. But if I'm keeping track of where my big attacks are and I'm like, is it on top now? Now I'll block with a shield. And that works. That makes the shield pretty strong. And then Victor specialization shield that is just it's a legendary and you can't play in limited. It's legendary. Yes. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> I knew that. That's really was, legendary. Uh, so it's, I am looking at it right now. Orem Aegis, uh, legendary guardian equipment. Okay. I, I was Oops. sitting diagonally from that. somebody <laughs> who was super hyped. They were like, oh man, I peeled gauntlets of iron will. My, my guardian deck's going to be sick. <laughs> and uh, they got bad news. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, in general, I think draft pods should usually be three brutes, three warriors, two guardians, because the guardians are the the weakest class. Though we had a draft the the night, like in the hotel lobby after the tournament, where there were three guardians, and the finals of the draft pod was a guardian mirror. So that was kind of different. What night was this? It was when I when you passed me the insane Victor deck. I played against Jacob Baugh's Betsy deck in the finals of the draft pod. Oh yeah, because you literally had like passed you the golden sun and golden glare, and every single and Mil- I I almost passed you Miller's you passed grindstone Miller's grindstone gold. the other way, <laughs> yeah the other way, but yeah so it can't come together, but it I'm just the most terrified of playing guardians going forward now just because their floor is the lowest of any of the heroes in the set I feel like yeah so jumping back to my calling I actually drafted guardian in my top eight draft and. This was kind of like a showing of what can go wrong if there's too many guardians in the pod. There were three guardians in the top eight pod and also a fourth person who was drafting a lot of guardian cards and ended up pivoting to warrior, I believe is what happened. But it my deck was not very good. I was beat up pretty badly in the, the quarterfinals. I think I could have made a few play mis- uh, play decisions that would have gone better for me i'm not sure if that's enough to win the game even if i play perfectly and it's flesh and blood's a really hard game you're just not going to play perfectly most of your games so sure um but yeah Gu- guardian definitely not in the best spot i i think that they have traditionally been quite good in their limited formats both bravo and old time were very good in their limited formats and well these two guardians betsy and victor they got they got their work cut out for them yeah and I know the person you never had an opportunity to play warrior in that pod. Cody Williams, I think pack one, pick threes took like blue engage switchblade or something like that. Just like a blue common three block. That wasn't even a wager effect. He just hard forced warrior. I watched. Yeah. 
basically at the start of the draft. Do you think that's just like super risky or it's better to send signals like that early? Well, I think if you believe the players you're passing to are are willing to move off, then it's probably okay. Maybe you first and second pick some warrior cards. If the person passing you is warrior, then maybe you can get off the plan. But if they don't hard cut warrior, then you're just like locked in and you're just, um, that's a reasonable plan, especially because if you are much more confident playing something, feel like you'll do better with a medium warrior deck than a slightly better guardian deck than, or a slightly better brute deck than the equity you're giving up in the draft by forcing something and maybe, maybe having a slightly weaker deck on average, then it is worthwhile. And I also was very warrior leaning in that top eight draft. I played warrior in all three of my pools, I guess my sealed pool. I played warrior in both of my first two drafts. I played warrior. And then you I actually Olympia don't sell yourself short. Michael. I did you play Olympia. Olympia. We'll get it. We'll get it. But I actually first picked a red agile engagement and looked at the next pack and it was missing a warrior common. And I was like, Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Cause I, I was definitely wanting to play warrior. I think I second picked something that could go in warrior, but could, but could also be played in something else. And then the third pick, I'm like, okay, there's really no warrior cards here. I'm pretty sure Cody is just warrior. And I moved off warrior and ended up with a pretty mediocre Betsy deck as the, yeah, his strategy got him all the way to the finals though. So can't yeah. Be that bad. Yeah. I think I just didn't feel very comfortable drafting brute, which is something that ideally I will have fixed before the pro tour. There's still a lot of time before between now and then. So I felt like I wanted to be warrior or guardian and guardian was not very open in this pod and I was hard cut off warrior. So I kind of just shifted to guardian, but I think my seat was supposed to be brute. I think if I had drafted brute, I would have had a better deck and probably done better. Oh, well, that's okay. Now, you know, for the next limited calling. (laughs) Oh no, I, I really wanted to go to Liverpool this weekend. I didn't want to go until like, two days ago when I was done playing the sealed calling and I'm like, man, that was so fun. I want to do another sealed calling. I love sealed callings. And then, well, I feel like if there were some formats and we had sealed callings with them, I would not have been enthused. Like I missed the bright light sealed format, sealed calling at worlds because it wasn't a standalone calling and I was playing worlds, but I feel like I was okay missing that though. I do kind of wish Dallas was sealed instead of CC last year. Sure. That. Yeah would have made sense to me instead of being the dead CC format. But oh well. Yeah. I I don't think there's any more limited callings on the schedule. And it's maybe that's also because it would be for the next set, which would then also drop at the end of May, beginning of June, I believe. Like right around national season. I think that's when the next set is. So mm-hmm. maybe once that cart starts rolling around, they'll announce another limited calling somewhere. Uh but I said this in Hartford and I just want to note is that we've lived up to our promises on the podcast, Michael, where we <laughs> said if there was ever team sealed battle harden or, or call it, we'd be, we were there. We were at the team sealed. We, we, mm-hmm. we, we were there supporting it. We have now played in two thirds of the limited callings in the United States. Uh, the only one that we didn't play in, I believe was, wasn't there one in Dallas? Like it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was Dallas. Like right as we started playing. It was like the week before Cincinnati and yep. we were like, well, why would we go to Dallas when we're just going to Cincinnati next week anyways? And then we were at Cincinnati. So we are doing our part to support limited. And there was huge turnout for this event. I think it was like 420 some odd players or something like that. What's the number? And the, there was so, the room was so packed that the on-demand events just couldn't fire. Like I just was like, oh, I'm scrubbed out. I'm sad, but maybe I can do some drafts for practice on the pro tour and I'll go to the event stage and cash in my bronze <laughs> ticket that I got with my payable package. And I would like one draft for flesh and blood, please. And they said, no, there's no room. Don't you want to see all these people? They're too busy playing flesh and blood. We have no room for you to play flesh and blood. Get out of here, loser. Oh. And I, I sulked away and I was sad. Yeah, the... I think the event was a huge success. I think people like the format. People showed up to play the format. And if I I actually feel like this is the first set in a while that's felt like 
to me that felt like LSS really worked hard on the sealed format and made sure that all three classes were solid and supported and sealed. I think we talked a bunch about how Guardian was a little bit weak, and it wouldn't surprise me if some of these Guardian numbers were one higher and they and Guardian was just way too good when all of these or several of these cards were one point higher and they decided to make them all one point lower. And then you're mostly only guarding if you have a pretty good bomb or you just hit a bunch of playable three blocks in your sealed pool, which will still happen sometime. I think you're still supposed to be guarding like 10 to 20% of the time, maybe, maybe even slightly more than that in sealed, which is, that's great. That's way more than you were supposed to be ninja and outsiders or uh ranger and tales of Arya. If we go way back or even Dromai and uprising, I'm trying to think of other sealed formats. Yeah, that's fair. And then welcome to Wraith. You could be pull, pull pools, I guess, builds, build pools of any of the four heroes in that format. Katsu came together at least in that format, but was still uh, there because Kadachis were pretty good in that format. I, I actually think, in my opinion, Reinar came together the least, but I was just like, I was pretty low on evasion in general. I think Kadachis did evasion better and the, a lot of the brute class cards were a lot weaker than the ninja class cards. Yeah, that's fair. And then those are all the limited sets that I've ever. Or no, Monarch was good. Yeah, Monarch was fine sealed format. Yeah, I, I don't think I played a ton of Monarch sealed. We've played a few pools against each other, but yeah, I definitely don't feel really qualified to give strong opinions on Monarch or uh, Arcane Rising sealed. I don't think Arcane Rising had sealed. <laughs> uh I feel like we we played like two or three pools. I remember one of them. I had this card I, called Induction Chamber, and that, that was. Uh, I must have blocked this out of my memory. <laughs> I don't. I thought I thought that was a a supplemental set. It was the first supplemental set, and then they did a second supplemental set with with Crucible of War, and then they they brought back Draft. Right? I thought that's how it went. Um, no, no, the Arcade Rising definitely had sealed. I don't know if it was. <laughs> If you say uh, so, you know, I mean, I guess you can make sealed out of anything. Like you could play sealed Crucible of War if you want. So. <laughs> it would be it would be tough. Go for it. Ah. Anyway, heavy headers, really good sealed format, really good draft format. I think this is this might be my favorite set actually, in terms of like design and development, and how the just like the the game the games play. It's not my favorite aesthetic aesthetic, aesthetic wise. I think that's Tales of Aria. Tales of Aria is so pretty, but playing the actual games, ah, oh, it's so good. Yeah. I will say what I liked the most about Tales of Aria still, though, was just like playing Briar games where it was just like, oh my God, if we actually sequence this one card different, we get an extra two point of damage. And then now we're presenting 18 damage or something or something ridiculous mm-hmm. instead of like 14. And like, there was just so much depth and complexity to that format, not only in Briar, but I feel like uh, a lot of old times, like pitch stacking decisions and when you use your reaction and how you drafted that deck, mattered a lot and then lexi was there and so <laughs> that format felt kind of similar to this I, I i'm i think right now I, I i basically am holding heavy hitters and tales of aria pretty much even sp- it's a, a like a tie at the moment but i think that's saying a lot because it was tales of aria used to be like my favorite set not close compared to anything else and now having a set that is close Still really good. Yeah, I I do agree that Briar was really fun to play in limited Briar Mirrors. Although like in CLD you played mostly Briar Mirrors in that format. I think the games were very fun and like very skill intensive because the difference between maximizing your hand and not like was often several points of value. It was like, and it, it felt really rewarding to figure out the actual lines that you were supposed to take. Yeah. And I was even saying this on Friday and I'll still, still, still talk about this now. I think anybody who has a criticism where it's like, well, it's just what you open, that's what's going to determine whether or not you're going to seal still. I think that is just so reductive. And I think we saw, obviously, very good players. Like this top eight was stacked with limited players. And it wasn't like uh, like the odds of you and Yanji and everybody else who made top eight just like saying like, oh, they opened really good pools on Saturday. Like that's obviously why they made that. No. Like you guys played very well and you looked and you were able to build your decks in very efficient and and 
positive ways. And I think more games in this format are won and lost based on deck building than gameplay sometimes where like, for example, in my second loss, my opponent made some, some pretty big mistakes, but my deck fundamentally just couldn't win game that just wasn't powerful enough to win a game and so that's that's all on me like i should have built a better deck i should have taken the resources given the, I, I don't blame my pool i think my pool was fine i blame myself for not building and evaluating the the pool of resources given to me better so uh, i think that is especially true in this format and i think building sealed pools in this format is incredibly difficult and i still think to this day i've not built a single sealed pool like correctly which is crazy considering when i go back to like magic the gathering i feel like oh it's just the seal pool i get it like i understand how to put all the pieces and puzzles together like pretty easily i feel like still to this day but in in this seal format i'm just lost sometimes i'm just like i have like no idea like i said it took, I, I was registering my deck up until one minute when the time was called in, in for the calling yeah which is Especially interesting because registering your deck, you're just checking a hero. You can present whatever cards you want. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's that's just like part of sideboarding too. It's like since like deck construction and sideboarding are functionally the same and limited in this game, um, outside of the drafting process and the hero selection. But like, you're basically you you can present a different deck in a different matchup. So if you know anything about your opponent's deck too, which is a lot harder and sealed than like in an eight person draft pod. Sometimes like by round three, you know what bombs are in some of your other draft pod members decks and sealed is just like a big open field. You don't really know what's going to be in their deck when they're going to present when they show you their hero. Yeah. And I will say drafting in this format. I think we talked about this a little bit last time too. You can still train wreck sometimes and the 14 card packs and getting to playables is still something that's in the back of my mind right from pick one where I'm just like, I hope I make playables. Like I just have to pick and commit maybe pick two, pick three heart, like then just figure this stuff out. Because if you waffle for two to three picks, you're in crack. Sometimes you're just in crack bobble land and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's part of how I ended up just on Guardian instead of Brute in my seat was I, I've i I've pivoted to Brute late before and ended up with three crack bobbles in my deck. That was my first draft. I was trying to stay open, trying to figure out the right lane. I figured out the right lane was Brute and I ended up with three crack bobbles. This time I was like, well, I'm not going to win a, a calling with three crack bobbles in my deck. I just have to pick something. I first picked a Warrior Common. Warrior was not open. I just have to make a decision. And I actually ended up with exactly 30 playable cards I could put in my deck in my Betsy draft, which was both like great that I made playables, but like the, you know, I don't have any sideboarding <laughs> decisions. I'm just presenting this 30 and I actually ended up getting fatigued in the game that I lost in uh, my first round of the top eight. So mm -hmm. just didn't have enough playables to, well, there were some play mistakes, too, but would have been nice to have a few more playables I could put in my deck. I really wish there were 15 cards in packs. And I know the reason why there aren't that many cards in packs is LSS is worried about fatigue being too good and that if people did just have more cards available to them, well, they would just pile it in and just be like, well, now I am play playing my 42 card deck or whatever because I just all I did was take cards. I didn't draft equipment and now I just can't lose because I just have so many cards in my deck. Just just make it so you can, there's a max 35 cards in your deck. Just say you can play anywhere between 30 and 35. I don't think that that's too much of uh complicated rules enforcement or uh cumbersome for new players like it's no different than just saying you can only play 30 cards like 30 cards is the minimum and 35 cards is the maximum i think it's clean and i think it would give players a lot more agency and freedom when actually drafting decks yeah it's really tough because like the way that a lot of decks that were good at blocking would be these like I'm, I'm thinking back to the Ranger decks, like Riptide and Lexi decks that don't have evasion and just have. I guess Ice Lexi kind of had evasion, but not like all, not all Lexi's decks had evasion. That these decks that were good at blocking could beat them consistently. It was just playing extra cards. Like their answer was, "I'm going to play extra cards. I'm just going to block everything you do, and you're going to run out of cards, and you don't have a weapon. And I'm just going to kill you with my weapon when you run out of stuff to do." And if you, I, I actually kind of want to know what the world would be like if it was more extreme if it was just like a limited deck has 30 cards in it period you don't have 35 cards you don't have 31 cards you're just playing 30 cards maybe these decks just like 
run out of cards and die. But if your opponent doesn't have extra cards to block your stuff and they're playing their cards on defense, you're playing your cards on offense, all your cards are going to be worth one or two or three points more than theirs because the cards attack for four or five, six cards block for three. Maybe that just, if they just can't board up extra cards, then maybe you just kill them. I know sure. in uh, Outsiders, Riptides, like I felt like you couldn't pivot to Riptide no matter how open he was because Riptide... The only way Riptide killed people was basically by fatiguing by damage, um, where he was throwing damage and on hits at you. You had to block and you were down out of cards and he'd have cards left to kill you. So you needed to have like enough cards in your deck to kill them if they presented like 35 cards or something and a lot of their cards blocked three. So Riptide, you just couldn't pivot in too late because if you ended up with a 30 card Riptide deck, you're just getting fatigued by everyone with extra cards. Yeah, and it would let LSS be a little bit more liberal when designing defensive cards then without being like, well, I can't, pre- pre- uh, we can't reprint like unmovable or these like sink below or defensive reactions or good defensive cards because they're just too good and limited and then fatigue's too good. Well, if the defensive, if everybody just capped to 30 cards and heroes are still, and numbers are still pushed where like attacking makes more sense, especially with like in the new world of weapons sucking, like that also is already a huge hamper on fatigue strategies anyways, because you can't just block three cards, swing a hammer for four, block three cards, swing a hammer for three. It's just not, you're not winning that game. You're just, you're just not being efficient enough. Yeah. So I think between that and, and I, I said between 30 and 35, because that way it gives players some agency and flexibility. And there could be times where, uh, playing 35 cards is still a mistake and it's still not good enough and things like that. But I, I, I'm also not opposed to just a hard 30 where uh, people just have to build their decks in the most efficient way possible with 30 cards. in. I think that would also make it a lot harder to build decks in general because finding the perfect 30 in your pool or in your draft even would be really difficult. Yep. And it's going to change based on your matchup too. So, I think it makes sideboarding more relevant. Making the correct sideboarding decisions matters more when you, well, I mean, it, it matters a lot either way, but you feel the, I think you'll feel the choices more if it was just you're playing 30 cards always. And I guess most of my time playing Flash and Blood Limited, I've just played 30 cards always because that just seemed like that was just the best thing to do in a lot of the formats. Even in Bright Lights, I almost always played 30 cards, but um there were definitely de- decks where you're not supposed to do that. Like sometimes with your Tekla deck and sometimes with max decks, you wanted to play more than 30 cards, but dash IO, I was almost always a 30 card deck. And that was my, at the end of the format, that was my favorite hero to draft. It's been a while since we played WTR. Did you play more than 30 in WTR? Never. Uh, actually, that's not true. I shouldn't say never. I had one Bravo deck where I played like 35 cards in a remembrance. And I think that deck was bad because I put remembrance in it. And I'm pretty sure you beat me or the games were really close. But I think almost all of my WTR decks were 30 cards. I should bust open some WT. We should play some WTR next time we hang out, too. We have a long list of games to, to get through at this point. But I could still go for some WTR. Just to just to get, since this set's now so fresh in my mind, I could get a little more direct comparison point in my mind, maybe. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, jumping back to the finals, or not the finals, the calling, sorry. Uh, I played Olympia in day one. I think my deck would have been much better as a Kasai deck, except for the fact that I had, what's Olympia's hat called? Prize something. Prize Galia? Prize Ga- Prize Galea. Yes, that's right. It's a two block temper hat. It has an ability that I tried to use in the calling. I paid one resource to get my attack or my sword. The ability that I, if I hit them, I draw a card. And then my opponent's like, that's not what that does. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> no that's what kasai does instead you, you pay an ability yeah. to make an attack wager or you pay a resource to make it wager a gold with them and uh then you get two yeah you, uh, that's you that's get... almost always worse than just blocking for one with it but occasionally it can be better but you almost always want to just block for one rather than get two gold tokens and spend a resource and your hat to do that um so uh that was that was my sealed i went seven one in the sealed portion i lost a warrior mirror I think. Yes. I lost the Warrior Mirror and won my other seven rounds. And then in the first draft, I was drafting a sweet Kasai deck. And then 
uh, at the end of pack one, I'm like, I have like one yellow or two yellows. And then I have my next pack and there's the prize Galea again. And I'm like, all right, we're no longer drafting a Kasai deck. We're playing Olympia. <laughs> and I took the hat and didn't look back. Um, draft three or the second draft was a very similar story. I was drafting a Kasai deck and then pack three, pick one. I open a prize Galea and I'm like, okay, I guess we're Olympia again. <laughs> I am an Olympia only gamer. My my second draft was really interesting because there were four warriors in that pod. There was only one guardian and three brutes. My first round, I played a warrior mirror and uh, my poor opponent had rising power in their deck. And the result of having rising power in your warrior deck is it gets removed from your deck and then you get an IP two. So that small mistake made that game not very close. <laughs> and then I played against... Uh, Yanji, as, who was the only guardian in the pod. That game was not remotely close. I think he was at three life when he was both killing me with damage and fatiguing me. <laughs> and three life, but it was like uh, he took some damage to go to three to just finish me. It didn't, like, probably would have had more Made life. Made it look close that. on yeah. paper. Yeah. I like to say that as, as like, I'm getting my opponent down to, like, low life totals. I'm like, it looks close it's, on paper now, at least. Yeah, it's one of those games where he's at three life, but the game wasn't remotely close. <laughs> And then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. my win and in was another warrior mirror. So I, I got, managed to squeak out a 2-1 despite being the fourth warrior because I think I had the best of the four warrior decks. And also the rising power thing made it even if I didn't have the, a better deck than them. I, uh, I was gifted you had a legal. One. You had a more legal deck. I did, I did have a more legal <laughs> deck. So that was my, my drafts. Uh, I was definitely wanting to play warrior. And fortunately, I got to in... I think it was the best in my sealed. And then I had my first draft. I think I was definitely supposed to be warrior. My second draft, maybe not. There ended up being four warriors. I don't know if it was me or someone else that was supposed to pivot, but I did not pivot. I got my hat. So that hat helped a lot too. Okay, cool. Well, uh, anything you want to change up for Pro Tour now? Do you want to give away your secret Pro Tour drafting strategies now that we're at the end of the episode? All right. I, I want you to all pay very close attention to this block threes are good you want to block for three <laughs> that's my it's secret. called heavy hitters michael <laughs> not heavy blockers what are you talking about so uh i think in every format three blocks are better than people think they are but the less density of three blocks your deck has the more impactful each three block is so now three blocks are even more important than they were in other formats and they were, they've always been important so draft draft three, three blocks when you're looking at your sealed pool you probably should play the hero with the most three blocks unless like something else is happening if if it's close or there's like a blue issue or something then maybe not but in general if you have 15 three blocks in one class and 12 in another you should be very heavily leaning towards class of 15 three blocks i will say there's one caveat to that and i think in this format specifically three block non-attack actions are even more prized and better because War because Centauri Sabres exist in Warriors punish blocking with attacks, even if they do block three pretty heavily. So I think both of us now are at the point where whenever we're playing against Warrior, like unless something's we're in dire straits and there's just no good way to use our hands, you just shouldn't be blocking with attack action cards. Well, you can block their attacks with your attack action cards. Like they're not, sure, not sure, sure, sure. like if, when they attack with their rally the rear guard or their three for seven wage cards or wind up cards, then I'm happy to put my extra attacks in front of those yeah that makes sense but you still have to be careful in front of the warrior attacks because a lot of the warrior reactions just say warrior card but yeah most of the time if they're attacking with a three for seven or three cost attack they don't have floating resources or any ways to really use anything so yeah the the reactions are usually i don't want to say they're face up but usually like you can have the idea that your opponent has some kind of attack reaction that and the attack reaction a lot of them punish you for blocking with attacks both the agile and vigorous engagement give the tokens if you block with attack action then there's the rare fatal engagement i think it's called that gives That's it a the big one yeah a big pump but that one costs two resources so it's hard to even harder yeah not represent it if you're going to threaten it <laughs> but yeah that's actually part of why favor drafting warrior so highly is because you have like this tons of access to three block non-attack actions and even like at rare you have these three block attack reactions which both are good against Centauri sabers and are also really good against overpower so I think Warrior's in a, in a good position in this format. I strongly prefer playing Warrior to Brute because I 
I, I did this in a practice draft. I cast a wild ride. I had a yellow seven or a yellow six and a red six in my hand. I'm like, all right, even if we hit the yellow, as long as we don't like, as long as we just don't draw and discard a miss off the top, this is going to be a good turn. And I pitch my blue, cast my wild ride, two in hand, one in arsenal, draw a card off the top. It's not a six, discarded it. So <laughs> uh, that was my turn. Was a, my five card hand was attack for six, and classic brute life might have actually been attacked for five it might have been a yellow wild ride but anyway uh i think that there's a lot to figure out still at the format with brute i think there's things you can do to minimize variance when you're casting wild rides but there's gonna be you gotta you gotta cast wild rides sometimes and you gotta do what you can to make that card as good as you can make it but ah i do not want to be the one I, i i have not figured that out yet and i've got to figure that all out before the pro tour because surely there's definitely things you can do. And maybe the answer is just you draft a deck that has 26 sixes and only a few, and as few misses as possible. But I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet. Well, we got six weeks to figure it out, buddy. So clock's a ticking. Let's, let's go hop in the draft queue. And the next time you're going to draft heavy hitters, always remember, mind your manners. Thanks for watching. And, and-